the way the radio business is going, down the tubes, essentially, except for a handful of stations. The stations I worked for here in Nashville are just a class X. They, everything's local. Every, they do all their research locally, uh, programmed locally. You know, until that changes, they're just going to be on the top of the heap anyway. But revenue for radio has gone down, mm. you know, because people have other options. They have podcasts they can now get a lot of attention on for not that much money, you know, depending on, you know, of course, if you're advertising on Rogan's show or something like that, yeah, there's a premium to it. Um, but a lot of these people that are working in radio are so in love the ro- with the romantic notion of what radio was. They're just holding on, you yeah. know? And I'm like, guys, if anybody can serve the creative space that's happening as we speak, it's radio people all day long. Hey, what's your problem? You have business problems? We have business solutions. Not guaranteed. Well, maybe. No. Life is a fight. Oh, yeah. In business, every day is a fight. No kidding. So, hey, what's your problem? Yes, thank you, John David Wells, the big voice guy for the show. Check him out at the Wells Report. He's on Facebook doing the uh, political talk thing. He's been doing it for a long time. Several decades, dare I say. This is the What's Your Problem podcast, where we talk to Middle Tennessee business owners and professionals about the one thing. It's always something. It is always something. That keeps you up at night when you're owning or operating or being a pro in business, especially around here in Middle Tennessee with everything that's going on. This is an audio and video podcast. Check us out at whatsyourproblempodcast.com. The year is winding down, and uh, yeah, our BHAG is not not yet met, but we're on the way. 10,000 average downloads per episode is what we're shooting for, so if you could help us out. Find, follow, rate, review, subscribe, all that fun stuff at What's Your Problem Podcast.com. I am your host, Jim McCarthy, with Jim McCarthy Voiceovers.com and it's your show.co, where you can get a fabulous podcast just like this produced for you. And today, hailing all the way from uh, somewhere in Middle Tennessee, you're like uh, east of here, correct? Nolensville. Nolensville. That's right. That's a, a very a, a similar to Spring Hill. Rapidly growing area, very congested, and a ton of traffic out there too, right? Oh, it's wonderful. It's got one road going in and out. I know. And just keep on building houses, man. Sean Kaplan, thanks for coming out here, bro. Oh. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. Met you a couple of weeks ago at the Impact Effect at the Wild Horse Saloon with Mr. Jim Morris, who put that on. I guess that's going to be an annual thing, we hope. I hope so. That was a fun uh, event to be a part of. Yes. And I said to you, as soon as I met you, I'm like, man, I see your name everywhere. And I feel like we're orbiting each other and we're meant to to get to know each other. And we had a great conversation that day. We did. That was yeah. a really great time. It was a great conversation. It was what they say, uh, fortuitous. Fortuitous. So, fortuitous. Word Using the big day. words. I'll use it tomorrow. <laughs> so, of course, we always do the, uh, the dad joke challenge. The Dad Joke Challenge gets this uh, podcast kicked off because uh, dad jokes are just fun. They're like, uh, you know, Steve, uh, Stephen uh, Wright back in the day. He's essentially the first guy who brought dad jokes to light. Wow. He was very punny. Punny. So the Dad Joke Challenge is brought to you by Ed Fox and Trade Bank of Nashville. If your business has some services that are, things are slow and you got some product that is hanging out on the shelves a little too long, maybe it's got some moss growing on it, try out Trade Bank because it's a, not only a great alternative networking tool that you could get into for other businesses that think and do business the same way, it's a way for you to actually uh, conduct business on pennies on the dollar. It's an alternative economy. Check it out, Trade Bank of Nashville. All the links are in the description. I am just getting back into the flow of this thing because it's been a long Thanksgiving weekend. So forgive me if I'm a little spotty in my thought process. Yeah, you look rough. I know. <laughs> I do look rough. Thank you. That's just my normal look. <laughs> so joke number one, Mr. Uh, Ed Fox also tells the dad joke. So I have no idea what's coming up. Yes. He's a, he's a dad joke aficionado, believe okay, it. Okay, nice. All right, here we go. Joke number one. G'day, y'all. Do you remember the joke I told you about my spine? It was about a week back. <laughs> it was about a week back. Yeah. Oh, We're man. both dads, okay, so we can use these. Yeah, that's good. And uh, make our kids cringe even more. 
Hey, why'd the kid cross the playground? To get to the other slide. Yeah, it's not bad. bad. This is usually the point where the guest who wonders what the heck did they get themselves into, but you know, here we go. Did you know Bruce Lee had a brother? Yeah, his name was Broccoli, but not many people liked him. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I know. The first one was the best. So far, we're, uh, we're almost done. Speaking oh. of siblings, some people think Cardi B is pretty. She has a sister that's a personal trainer. Her name is Cardi O. She'll take your breath away. But um, but I knew it was like Cardi. It had to be Cardi. I was like Cardi B. Is it gonna be Cardi C? No, probably Cardi O. Final one, I promise. What's green has six legs, and if it drops out of a tree onto you, will kill you. A pool table. Yeah, that'd do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> he just saves the best one for last. But, you know. There you go. The dad joke challenge. Brought to you by Ed Fox and Trade Bank of Nashville. Check them out. Again, the, all the links are in the description. And uh, reach out to him. He, he'll gladly get a coffee with you. And you can enjoy his... He will have a dad joke at the ready for you and all that fun stuff. And you can listen to that awesome Aussie accent for an hour or so. So there you go. All right, Sean, off we go. So we started talking. We had an interesting conversation at the Wild Horse. Uh, you got into all things, your background and everything like that. Um, I would like to kind of relive that a little bit because you do have a fascinating backstory. You know, you grew up without a father, right? Correct. And you made something of yourself despite of that. Desp- in spite of that. Despite of that. Despite, yeah. In spite of that. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Like I said, I'm rough. <laughs> Uh, so start from the beginning. How did it all begin? How did you start like honing your entrepreneurial uh, talents back in the day? Well, first I am a dad. And so I, I'd love those jokes. By the way. So I'm trying to remember a couple of them. I just always told the same one, you know, what do you call an angry carrot? Steamed vegetable. There you go. You know, I, I like the, uh, the elevator one that I passed gas in an elevator once and it was wrong on so many levels. Oh my gosh. I know. It's, go. it's bad. It's, you know. So, um, I, you know, by default, I, I was somebody who just had something to learn because if I didn't have something to learn, I didn't really have much to lose. Right. You know, and, but I didn't really know that. I mean, I didn't grow up like, you know, super sad, you know, kid and rough, you know, neighborhood and, you know, abusive parents or anything like that. But, You know, my mom did the best she could and she had to work multiple jobs and, you know, not having a father there, I would, I would find people that would, you know, I'd, I'd ask them if they would show me how to do it. Right. You know, I figured the worst thing they're going to say is no. But you knew to ask. Yeah, I knew to ask. So that's how I think I got conditioned to saying, Hey, it's okay to ask other people for help. Right. Um, and so when I got an opportunity to you know, first make, you know, some money waiting tables at Demas's in, in Murfreesboro. I worked there through college. Mm-hmm. Um, that was the next big pivot in my life because I realized that I could get paid based on rewarded on my merit versus just getting paid the same amount every time, no matter what. Right. I also could dictate my income if I was willing to work a little more. Mm-hmm. And that was in my blood because I watched my mom work three jobs and she always had me work and doing something. And so that became an asset too. So to answer your question, um, I think the best way to is just explain it is like, I started out early saying, hey, it's okay if I don't have all the answers, I need other people to help me. And it rewarded me later in my entrepreneurial career because it makes me coachable. You yeah. know, I, I try to be willing to listen and, and I'm not afraid to try you know, new things. Um, so yeah. And I've been there before, so I don't mind trying new things. And if they fail, they fail. I know, you know, it's okay. I'm not going to, you know, fall apart. What's one of the things that I impress upon my kids, sometimes to our detriment, uh, is to always ask. Yeah. The worst thing that could happen, you know, I always say the answer to the unasked question is, you know, you don't know or no. Yeah. It's the worst thing that can happen. Right. You know, just ask the question. You never know what you might get. Yeah, some of those questions you ask, you might be surprised what you get out of them. Right. You get life opportunities, you get job offers, you know, you make new friends, 
Um, you, you'll get into new business ventures by asking lots of questions. There's so many benefits of it, but yeah, I, I think something's going on where a lot of people are being taught, like, you know, don't ask questions, you know, and you won't look stupid. Right. Don't ask questions and, you know, people won't think you're weird. You know, don't ask questions and maybe people won't really know the real you. Well, it's like a brainstorming <clears throat> session. Um, we kind of kick around the idea that there are no bad ideas. And some people that I know will say, yeah, there are. I'm like, no, I get that. I know there are bad ideas, but sometimes a bad idea can sprout legs and actually create other ideas. You yeah. know, you never know. It may not be the greatest idea on the surface, but all of a sudden, if it inspires other people in the room to say, oh, that's, there's, you're almost there, but there, that might actually bring us to where we need to go. You know, you just never know what it might just inspire. You know, especially when it comes to creativity just happened today. This morning, we were in this room. Uh, I told my team, I said, I want to start doing more creative video regarding the lights that we sell, which is kind of, it's not tough, but I don't want to have to be the one that always comes up with the ideas. And typically I don't, as I get older, I mean, honestly, my brain's getting a little bit tired and I'm not as, uh, you know, creative as I used to be. Now, when I was with Jack FM, and we started that station back in 05, that was like putting your brain on a, you know, you had to, you had to put it into the gym yeah. because everything you knew about radio, blow it up and try the stuff that you, everyone told you that would break the rules. And it was like the wild, the wild west yeah. with that radio station. And we did all that stuff, dead air. I mean, all sorts of stuff. Didn't and it was compete, fun. Didn't you compete with KDF at that time? Um, Is KDF still around? Uh, they, they were uh, a country station at that time. Oh, they point. gone country by then. Yeah. Okay. They were country when we moved here in 05. Remember I Rhino? Believe. Yeah. Rhino was one of my buddies. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, Ryan, we had, we had Moose. Guy. Okay. Moose on, uh, he was with, jeez, uh, I can't remember the station he came from, but he came to us around 05, you late know, 05. There was just something special about, you know, having to change through your radio stations to try to catch your show. Yeah. Now you can hit the button and watch it whenever you want. Yeah. You know, and it's it's nice, but also I I like the anticipation of like, hey, listen up, because like you're only going to be able to hear this probably right now. Kids will never know what that's like. (laughs) They will never know the anticipation of waiting for your favorite song ever. But getting back to the point of why I brought that up was because when we all sat in a room, no idea was a bad idea. And sometimes when you thought you had a a, just a, a a whizzer of an idea, the humility had to actually be worked on because everyone else would go, oh, that, eh, that's not that bad. And meanwhile, you're sitting there going, oh, wow, I thought that was really good. Happened all the time. Writing meetings were, were could be fun or just torture. Yeah. You know? You know, I think a lot of things growing up, uh, you know, school, sports, extracurricular activities, sitting at the dinner table until you ate everything. Mm-hmm. A lot of things were painful for us. Yeah. You build know, character. Build character. Here's the here's real talk though, is where a lot of that is born, why people aren't taking entrepreneurial chances or going for their dreams and stuff, it's because when they were growing up, between the ages of six and fourteen years old, every time they made a mistake, you know, they were either chastised or disciplined. You know, a lot of parents are living out their childhood issues mm-hmm. through their children. Yeah. I see it all day long, Jim. Like, and I just do mortgages, but yeah. I see it because I've done a lot of deep work and a lot of therapy, you know, for gr- things that I, you know, grew through. But they, there's a lot of adults putting extreme pressure on these young adults and kids to perform at a certain level, which in turn, every time they don't live up to that level, they're di- feeling like they're disappointing their parents. Right. Therefore, when they become 18, 20, 25, 30 functioning adults, they can't make decisions like that or they get anxiety around it or they don't want to do it anymore because that, and it's unfortunate, but that's where it starts. Yeah, it does. Um, Have you seen some of these baseball dads? No. no. You, you haven't ever gone to like seeing these little league dads that are coaching it like it's major league baseball? Well, you see that with soccer too. They got their kids putting like the makeup up underneath their eyeballs and the kids like, you know, six years old. It's like, yeah, dad's taking it serious. Like they're playing ball year round. It becomes uh, not fun for the kid. 
I see it a lot in hunting. I love to hunt, deer hunt especially, but I see a lot of dads are like, they'll force it on their family. Like I tried to get my girls to go. Some, my youngest does, my oldest doesn't. Well, I'm not going to force her to do it. Yeah. You know? But yeah, I see that a lot with, you know, kids nowadays. And I think that's something kids don't want to disappoint their parents. They don't want to let them down. So if disappointment's associated with failure, that's how you're going to react when you get older. When I was growing up, it was college, college, college shoved down our throat. And my parents had a prideful ambition for my brother and I to graduate from college because that made the difference for them right. growing up. And both of them weren't college graduates. My father was barely a high school graduate. Right. Um, so for the both of us to go to college, it was a huge feather in their cap, a source of pride, which essentially what college is like we're going through that right now with our oldest daughter and i've told her since she was 10 you know probably even before that if it's not for you don't worry about it you'll figure it out if i could do it you can do it right all right and i had the, the odds stacked against me in the beginning i said but i understood the uh, notion of sales and selling uh somewhat early on and it got honed in my 30s uh and i understood it a lot better as a skill set for my life and I said, ultimately, what I want you to learn is that skill. In addition to the fact that if you do, you go to college, we're not taking out loans. Right. You're going to be 18. If you feel like taking out loans, I'm going to advise against it, depending on the size of the loan, because it's, it's grifting is to the nth degree. Mm. It's one of the biggest you know, financial... Uh, black eyes this country has ever seen upon its own citizenry. Uh, so if you go ahead and, and do that, that's fine. But I'm, I'm not taking out loans to put you through college. Now, on the other hand, if you get a free ride, then great, go. Okay? You don't have to pick a major. You know, I guess you do. I said, but you can always pick music, which is what you love, or communications. Mm -hmm. Just get the paper. Okay? Because yeah. at the end of the four years, it's a paper you can hang on your wall. Yeah. Okay. You know, so, and understand the reason why you're there is to network, build your network. Yeah. All right. And Smart make friends advice. and, you know, get into that area of things. So now we're kind of getting, well, she's, you know, we wanted to go to music therapy and I'm going, okay, uh, Cam, if you get into year two and three and the therapy aspect of it, it gets really tough and your grades start slipping, you lose all your money. So you need to think about that. Okay. I said, but there's always something to be learned. And I want you to understand that in your 20s is the time to you, for you to fall on your face. Right. That's okay. And that was never told to me. No. You know, I mean, it was go to college. Dude, 16 years old. What, what do you want to major in college? I'm 16. Right. What the hell do I know? Yeah. Would you believe that I, was, I thought I wanted to be a CPA? Really? Could you see me as a freaking CPA? You barely know <laughs> me, but I mean, come on. You'd be bored out of your I'd mind. Be, I'd put a freaking bullet in my mouth. Jeez. But I mean, that's, that's what I try and at least coach my kids is, you know, they don't really, they should listen to this episode because they'll be happy that I didn't try and force them to do anything. My son thinks he did. I did. I was a drummer. I am a drummer. You only want me to play drums because you did. No. I want you to play drums because you're awesome at them. You're amazing. And then he want, wanted to play the piano. Great. Let's get you a piano. Dude, within a couple of hours, he was playing like somebody has been playing for three months. Oh, that's good. It was amazing. Oh, you think I'm good at it? Yeah, you're amazing. Okay, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Dude, every time. And he's like, he kind of gets uh, a little bashful when I razz him about that. But I'm like, dude, you're not hurting me. Right. <laughs> you know? You're good at these things. Go, do it. You got to find what feeds your soul. Yeah. That's absolutely. what I teach him. Absolutely. But I mean, with your kids, you do the same thing? Yeah, my daughter, she's um, 13 or 14 now. And she, like, we, I've started having a discussion with her, like, what would make you happy? What would you enjoy? What do you feel is a unique and special gift that, you know, you have to bring the world? You know, what do you want to know more about? What are you curious about? Yeah. So, you know, I would probably say if I had to do it over again, right at about eighth grade, I'd start thinking about, hey, what am I going to start opening up the discussion? Mm -hmm. I was just, um, I was dealing with the whole boys and girls thing. So right. I knew either school was going to have the discussion with her or I was going to. So I got some books off Amazon. We went to J. Alexander's and had a daddy-daughter date. 
Right. And I said, here's some books. And we talked about, you know, being a young lady and what comes with all that. She's really super responsible. So, yeah, now I'm trying to tackle the uh, the college thing. Is she oldest? She's my oldest. And I have a nine-year-old, too. Okay. I think she just wants to be a vet. Right. Farm girl, something like that. Which is funny. Knock yourself out, man. Stella, Stella's our... She went deer hunt with me the other day. She sat in the deer blind, had her little binoculars up. Nice. And uh, so she likes to hang out on the farm. She's got a little four-wheeler, a little pink four-wheeler. <laughs> I mean, she's about drove the tires off that thing. Right. That's Stella. And then Ellie, she's in the, she's in the Swifty Nation. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah my, my daughter's too. Oh, really? Yeah. Like worship her. Oh, they know my, every song that she played on the road for the first time. And, are they watching the shows every night on TikTok or whatever? That someone's live streaming them. Well, probably. Yeah. I'm pretty sure she is. And Cammy's always coming in. So, Dad, tonight she played this song. And I'm like, huh? Yeah. You know, okay, cool. Yeah, that's great. My daughter's yeah. tried to get me to take them to, to, like, start this campaign where they legitimately thought I would take them to Australia to watch her play <laughs> next year. <laughs> And I was like, and <laughs> let me fire up the jet. You're you not know? doing that. <laughs> Jeez, oh, crow. Did you just see her when been she watching came too here? much Instagram and TikTok? Yeah. Is what they've been watching. <laughs> I'm not that dad. Did you uh, watch the? Did you go to the show when she played in uh, Nissan Stadium in the summer? Yeah, I held out all the way until like a month before. Yeah, and like then dad guilt sat in because there was other. You know, a lot of her friends were going. Yeah, and. You know, I had to really, really make that tough decision, but we had a great conversation. She knows how, you know, how much it cost and what it meant for us to go. And she, Ellie's a very, she's very grateful. She's a very, very um, encouraging and understanding. And so she's not one of those kids that expects things. Right. So you had to buy post-sale tickets. Yeah, I did. Oh my gosh. I got, I had a a friend actually that blessed us. They were, um, they were not able to make it. And they were like, Hey, this is, you know, we saw your post and, you know, we wanted to do this for you. And so they, we got a pretty darn good price for some good seats. Well, that's good. But we went the thun, thunderstorm night. Oh, that was uh, Sunday. It was scary. Yeah. We were stuck underneath there in that storm. Mm-hmm. But it was a good, good memory that we'll remember forever. While you and were sitting underneath. she came underneath. out and crushed it after. Yeah. She she put her work in. Man, man she crushed it. And for the uh, for the three or four million dollars she's making a night. Yeah. Three hours is nothing. She's She's an amazing performer. Like. I mean, she will definitely go down in history. She will. I'm actually still at odds. I'm a bit, whenever I get musicians and artists in here, I always ask, what do you think, it, like, this? what's the song today that's going to be the don't stop believing of 20 years from now? You know what I mean? Like how in the 70s and 80s, we had songs like Africa, don't stop believing, you know, separate ways, uh, jump in Panama by Van Halen, you know, all the classics that just go, they cross generations. You know what I mean? What's out there now or that we're going to be listening to? Well, there's, there's the top 20. And right. we got this guy named Morgan Wallen that has 18 of them. I haven't heard a song he sings. I don't think. Do what Have you? Get out of here. Maybe I did. I just don't know it's him. You haven't heard any Morgan Wallen songs? I probably maybe I did. I have no idea if I you, have. Yeah. You should you should talk more about Morgan Wallen, and I bet your viewer count will go way up. Oh, more about uh, oh yeah on the podcast. People love him. He's the number yeah. one country music artist. He brought, I know of him. He just brought country music back to the number one genre in music right now. Oh, he and Al Dean, I guess, right? Yeah, I don't know about that, but yeah, Al Dean, he's pretty. He's pretty pretty popular. I mean, after twenty years, man, he's still relevant. Well, he's going on twenty years now. Yeah, he's he's a hell of an entertainer. Yeah, hell of a band. I had yeah, Rich Redmond's their mm-hmm. drummer. You know, Rich. You're good friends with him. Wow. So you I'm and I fu- are going on fifteen years of friendship. I think. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard great things about Rich. We have some close friend, mutual friends, and I watch those guys. They're hell of a. Per- per- I just admire the performance of mm-hmm. a, of, a, of a professional. And like things are in place, they're doing what they're supposed to do. They don't skimp on equipment. You know, like your studio is really impressive. I mean, you don't you. skimp on stuff. You do it right. Like people pick up on that stuff. Yeah. And I think in business, you know, people just need to think a little bit more. Like, hey, you are on stage each day. Be you. Yeah. But present yourself well, right? And uh, we're in this day of social and digital, and I mean, it's going fast. It is. You just gotta put out content. And do it in the realm and uh, 
and the facility that of which you're used to, you're most comfortable. Yeah. Like this is, I'm just comfortable doing it this way. Those you videos know? that we did, um, uh, that day, uh, impact, you know, I've been posting them, getting a great response on my reels and my stories. Good. So, well, you got a hell of a following anyway. It's they're very engaged. Yeah, they are very engaged. Yeah. Um, I was taught by a good buddy a couple of years ago that, you know, he was way ahead of it. He's always been ahead of everybody on social. And he's just like a couple of years ago, he was like, it doesn't matter about your follower account. He's like, what matters is how many DMs do you get? How many people want to set appointments? Yeah. How many people want to come to something you're doing? How can you help other people? Mm -hmm. And he said, just focus on that and engagement and your following will grow. And it did, you know, but. It's discerning between, I guess, the opportunists that reach out. You know, a lot yeah. of you know, a lot of people reach out to me and they want me to subscribe to their podcasting platform, or you know, hey, I can get you a hundred thousand followers, that kind of thing. Oh and, boy, yeah. I was just we were just doing an interview in my office about that, right? You know, with the uh, my buddy John Medi Mediana, and he was, I was like, what. What is what is the common people need to know out there that are just trying to hire creative services? And we ripped off two or three like really good things that like people should ask themselves, right? You know, like and some red flags you should look for around creative. It's just a big space right now. Huge. And it's growing so fast and with AI and everybody's got a camera in their hand and people put out great content, but I've done it all different ways. And it's overwhelming. And with the, the way the radio business is going, down the tubes, essentially, except for a handful of stations. The stations I worked for here in Nashville are just a class X. They, everything's local. Every, they do all their research locally, uh, programmed locally. You know, until that changes, they're just going to be on the top of the heap anyway. But revenue for radio has gone down, mm. you know, because people have other options. They have podcasts they can now get a lot of attention on. For not that much money, you know, depending on, you know, of course, if you're advertising on Rogan's show or something like that, yeah, there's a premium to it. Um, but a lot of these people that are working in radio are so in love the with the romantic notion of what radio was. They're just holding on, yeah. you know. And I'm like, guys, if anybody can serve the creative space that's happening as we speak, it's radio people all day long. Especially in the podcasting space, because what I do with podcasting yeah. is no different than what we did in radio. Right. You know, I help. I mean, there are podcasts out there right now that I could insert myself into and say, okay, let's do this better. I mean, because they're all just generally poorly produced. Right. You know, no production elements, no production you know, value other than re good rec you know, recording quality, that kind of thing. But um, is it the yeah. stat? Doesn't the stats, what, what do they say? Like, you can get your first 20 episodes or 100 episodes. Like, what are those earmarks that people want to try to shoot for? If you're getting 20 to 50 downloads, you're in something like the top 60%, and then it goes up from there. Uh, I'm getting, on average, between two and 500 downloads an episode. Not bad. Wow. You know, but I have, this is up, probably going to be episode 170-something. Yeah, that's what, that was, that's what I meant, was number-wise. Like, yeah. somebody said, hey, get your first 20 done. Yeah. You'll start... You'll get, then you'll get to 100, and they were like, you'll look back at your first 10, 20 episodes, and you'll cringe. Yeah. yeah. I always tell people, I think I texted it to you, your first 20 episodes are you just getting reps, yeah. getting, finding your space, finding your muscle memory, uh, figuring out what you want to say at the top of the show, uh, you know, having that formula of this is the podcast, this is what it's about, this is what you could expect, here's the episode, this is what you could expect in the episode, this is why my guest is relevant, or the topic's relevant. And why you should keep on listening. That's why we do it, you know. And I completely violated my own rules going into this one. I, I hardly ever do it, have but you, I, I kind of do that. I, I have my I have it all written out in front of me. I've well, that's once. what I was just going to say. Yeah. Why don't Why don't you create an SOP around that? I should, and then put it up on your social and and sell that for nine ninety nine. Like you want to, you know, ninety nine ninety nine, whatever. Like you people would pay for that if if I could buy from you, Jim. Yeah, you know what a four page report, 10 page report, whatever. I don't, it, a, a video that shows me how to not make all the mistakes others make when producing a podcast, you know, how to cut, cut the curve. Right. I would pay money for that. I don't know. 
you know, I, I would justify paying like 49 bucks for it. Yeah. Not a bad idea. And just make it like a quick, easy thing. You could make some, I think it's needed out there. I would actually probably just put it out there just for right. free. Yeah, you know that's what I, mean? I do, right? <laughs> the Gary V thing. You know? That's what people tell me all the time. They're like, I do content creator university. That's mm-hmm. like call I was telling you. And I've been doing it for almost two years now. And seven, 800 people get to email, you know, about 50 to a hundred will jump on it. Yeah. And people all the time, they're like, so how much money you make off this? Or what do you charge people for this? And I'm like, nothing. Yeah. You know, because I've, I've, I've been following Ed Milet for years now. And I don't ever remember Ed getting to the point that he started like telling people, well, I'm going to start charging for this now. No. You know, and that's what's so impressive about him. And that's, I guess, uh, what I've always tried to avoid is that, I guess, not a huckster aspect of it, but the people that typically do that are, are not equipped to sell it, if that makes, makes sense. Yeah. They don't have the, the, the stripes. You know, there are, there are enough people out there, coaches and otherwise, that are trying to speak on things that they don't, that you shouldn't be speaking on that. Yeah. You know, locally here, there's a guy who talks about being a person of interest. Okay. And you probably know who I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Well, dude, then be a person of interest. Right. Okay. Because I yeah. know for a fact you paid for your following. Yeah. And I know for a fact that, you know, your engagement doesn't match the number count you have. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's the truth. Yeah. Stop trying to preach something you don't know much about. Yeah, when you're on social, like you just gotta be careful what you try and give people advice on because that's immediately what they're gonna turn the lens on. Right. Um, you know, I I've had people ask, like, well, how do you, you know, how do you get vulnerable? How do you become more you know, be be more comfortable with telling people, you know, about the certain areas of your life? Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, for me, the mindset just is if I'm just always telling people the truth. Yeah. And what I feel, you know, and what happened or what I've been through and what I've experienced and what mistakes I've made, then I don't ever have to worry about like not knowing what the answer is to questions that people ask me because I always know that I told them the truth. Right. I don't know. My mom raised me that way. Yeah. Probably because I found out that if I didn't, she whooped my ass. If I didn't tell her the truth, the second and third time around, it was a lot worse. And the fact of the matter is, dude, when you start trying to peddle bullshit, yeah. people know. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the other thing about living in today's generation. The BS meters are very highly tuned. Oh, dude. My, Off the charts. My mom would have boyfriends after my dad passed. So I, I was six years old and sat there and, you know, was watching cartoons when my dad called my mom before he took his own life. Mm. And um, so then the boyfriends would come in. First, you know, it's couple i'd I'd be like you know oh you're you know are you gonna be my dad hey you want to be my buddy you know Mm -hmm. whatever because i was only six seven eight years old but then after a while jim i get get a little wiser get a little smarter start noticing things dare we say cynical yep Mm -hmm. and and this is my mom and i'm gonna start learning from my previous situations oh yeah and so i developed this muscle of discernment that like my wife says is unlike anything she's ever seen like i can I can watch somebody for usually 30 seconds. I can talk to them for sure within 10, 15 seconds and feel kind of like I know what the real you know story is. Mm-hmm. So when they start bullshitting right out of the gate, like, yeah, I can tell. You pick right up on oh. it. You and my wife would have some long conversations. She's got that same gift. That's why she, <laughs> you know, we, hard. we have very little people in our inner circle. Man. Yes. <laughs> you know, because you just, you get older, you're just like, I just don't have time for this. Well, it's really hard to find people that just completely just live unabated, honest, right? You know, genuine, uh, loyal, and when you enter into that circle, like you start just realizing, like this is the only way I want to have my friendships and my relationships around me. Um, The reason why the fraternity of business influencers are in the top five, you know, your Ed Milet, your Cardones, Vaynerchuk. Two more I've got to think of. I can't think of them. Top Jesse, three. Jesse Itzler. Yeah, Itzler's, uh, yeah, he's very Someday. direct and, and, you know, pretty transparent. Uh, I've, I haven't really seen much from him. I've heard him. Brad Lee. Patrick Bet David. Yeah, Patrick Bet David as well. Brad Lee is, is the real deal, man. Yeah. What you is. see is what you get. Yeah. Um, they are in that fraternity because of that. Really? They're not trying to put on airs, you know. 
Yeah, we live in a world, you know, where if you go around trying to please everybody, you're going to lose that battle. That's for sure. My thing is I'm trying to learn how to do it with respect and candor, you know, um, open-mindedness, but have values around things that people know, at least they know what I stand for. Right. You know, somebody told me um, the other day, I was trying to post funny Thanksgiving things. And so I got several direct messages and people were like, I kind of saw a little bit of your, um, uh, you, uh, another side of you with the political, you know, the Donald Trump post. Mm -hmm. And I was like, look, you know, I was putting out some funny comments, interpret it the way you want. But people want to call me a Trumper, they can call me a Trumper. But what I've realized is like, if you're going to hate me over something that I like or don't like. I don't need you. Oh, gosh. Yeah. That's another reason why you can be, what's great about being honest and transparent and open is you learn out, you learn where the weak cracks are. You know, you learn where the leak in the tire is at. Oh, yeah. And then you can just steer clear of having a freaking blowout. You just know. And it's typically, I always get, if I meet a person, and this has happened several times throughout my life, but one instance comes to mind. I met he and his wife. Mainly, I reached out to his wife because she's a local creative here. I just had her on uh, a couple of episodes ago. And uh, just to sit down and talk, hey, I love what you're doing. I just became fully self-employed. Let's see if we can collaborate on some stuff. Well, her husband came with her to this, you know, and I don't blame him. She doesn't know me from Adam. Right. So, he, you know, he showed up and he did. He and I did most of the talking while she just sat there quiet. And... uh I came away from that meeting with such a bad taste in my mouth. Really? Like, I just didn't want to have anything to do with them. And sometimes you think, well, maybe it's me. But nine times out of ten, every single time, I'm vindicated. Where No, you're not the only one who thought that. I can see it a mile away. Yeah. I can see when it's the reaction. Because I deal with people for 23 years. Oh, the mortgage industry? Gosh. Majority of it was in person because I was taught and mentored that, hey, have your clients come to your office with their documents, do it the traditional right way. Right. And that was cool up until COVID. But I've met with a lot of people, probably 10,000 people. Yeah. I've had, you know, easily over 3,000 Zoom calls in the last few years. But I get to watch. Mm -hmm. And the neuro-linguistics and the mannerisms and... You can see who's in control, mm-hmm. and it's really sad sometimes when you could tell it's the husband that you know she doesn't want to say a single word because she's afraid. Yeah, what his reaction later probably will be. Well, that was a really good episode because we kind of addressed that, and I kind of told her that you know because of him I wanted nothing to do with any of you, you know, and she was like, "I get it." Yeah. Not, they're not together anymore. Yeah, but uh, it was one of those things where I. I I'm okay. You know, she's, she kind of confirmed it and as well as other people have confirmed to her. Yep. Yeah. And it's like, cause honestly, I, I try to look in the mirror. Maybe it's just me. You should have called you know? it out. Like that, that would have been Brad Lee would have been, what's up with you? Right. Like what's going, what that was 26. If that happens again in the future, now, you know, like what you're going to do different. Maybe you're just going to open up that can and be like, Hey, is there something going on here that I'm not aware of? Oh, in a situation like that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's... Um, that's what I'd do next time. That's, but yeah, that comes with experience, right? Yeah. I think there's a way, like the car business taught, to, taught me how to be bold. Yeah. Um, you know, the fundamentals of selling is kind of getting into those uncomfortable waters of asking high trust questions, leading them to the goal line. Mm-hmm. You know, those are the fundamentals, Similar to voiceover, you got to go through the fundamentals. Acting, you got to go through the fundamentals. And eventually you find your own voice. For me in the car business, asking those high trust questions, I had to like, not that you put on an act, but it is kind of, you know, with selling. You have to get into a role. You're playing a character almost. And then you become comfortable with asking those questions. Now, for example, on a test drive, I would come back and say, well, where do you want me to park it? Every time they would ask me that. I'll just pull into that spot over there. That's the, uh, I'm going to take it home in an hour spot. And they would laugh. And uh, I said, well, you know, and, and I would get comfortable with it. Does this feel like the one? Yeah. You want to see if there's, make, see, see if the figures are agreeable on it. Yeah. Okay. Follow me. That took a lot of cojones in the beginning to ask that question, but you had to find your way to do it. And I think a lot of life experience dictates that, Getting in a situation like that, even though at the time we feel blindsided, 
Cause I felt like blindsided. I'm like, is this guy really like posturing and flexing to me and all this? And after, afterwards you, you go through all the motions and going, man, I should have said, man, I should, when he said this, I should have said that. I think that comes with experience over time. And I would, I think I'm similar to you where if I were in something like that again, I'd be like, dude, what's your deal? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> yeah. You know? you know, I've learned, I've learned a lot just through, um, you know, I, re- I referenced, or I think I shared with you that I, I did, you know, I did a lot of deep work earlier this year, you know, right. dealt with some, some of my issues that I was fully aware of. And, um, when I went through that, one thing that I really learned, especially for men is like, and we just got to all realize this and the ladies are going to be like, yep, that's true. Right. But we just have to realize we're, we are all just young men. You can call us little boys if you want, but yeah. we're all just young men that are making decisions as adults now based on those young men, things that were, you know, burnt into our heads. Yeah. And sometimes it was losing a game and not being chosen for a team, being dumped by a girl. Maybe you were in a car wreck and witnessed something. Maybe you had abusive parents, but all of our decisions. And so now one thing, Jim, that I feel like I'm growing as a superpower is like when I see a dude acting tough, a dude cutting off his wife or disrespecting her or some guy wants to beat somebody up or whatever, even the guys in the gym with the tattoos and like just take it over the top and stuff and the steroids, yeah. they're all just young men who are making some sort of decision trying to over compensate for that. And I think the reason why I bring that up is like when you have a situation like that, you had somebody's just trying to overcome some sort of shortcoming that they've got. And, and I it, saw it like that. You know, I kind of knew the root of it that like, there's a confidence issue here. I knew that at the time, but I didn't know him well enough to be rude, I guess. Yeah. Which would come off as rude. And I, the way I would say it because of my Northeast influence it would come out like I was a Gavon, you know, from the Bronx. Yeah. And I, I wasn't confident in wanting to come off like that. Don't and be that, a schlep. You know, right. Don't be a schlep. Right. And that was, now it would just be like, oh, okay, dude, you feel better? You know, you're you, you, you going to insult my work anymore? Because that's what you're doing. Because you literally did that. You know, there was something, something that occurred in his life that, you know, happened to him. Those are the people I want to have on my podcast. Those are the ones where I start digging in right, and finding out what happened when, you know, you were a teenager or a young man that you act like a total jerk. There was a guy. <laughs> all the time, everywhere you go in life. But I also think that has to do with the age too. I mean, I think age 20 to 40 is a tough time for people in general. I think it's one of the tough, toughest oh. seasons in life. Go get married at 20 and 21 and 22 and Figure trying to pick their are. careers. Right. It's way too fast. It's, and it, and it, it's living up to expectations and all this, all this other stuff. I'm just pulling you up on Instagram. I'm not being rude. I was raised like you uh, were, where it was like, I basically, <clears throat> like, you either went to college and amounted to something. Yeah. Or you were just going to have a regular life. Or just be a lo- like it was told <laughs> to loser. me, a loser. Yeah. If you went to trade school, you, you were considered to be a loser. And it's funny, I went into a trade after high school, after college failed. And the guys I were working with were making, you know, 50, 5, 60 grand a year. And they were two or three years in. And it's like, dude, what, what am I doing wrong? It's like being a professional athlete, though, in yeah. trades. Because somebody younger and newer is going to come to replace you. And my mom, you know, they grew up in construction, a lot of construction. Yeah. So if it was up to her, like, she wanted me to probably frame houses after high school, like, what do you freaking do? You know, like that's not what I really, nothing against people framing houses. It's just like, I did that in the winters and the summers and it sucked, you know, but so she was pretty, whatever I did, she, she, she would support it. But everybody in like my uncle, when I was growing up, I wanted to be a dump truck driver. Right. Cause that's what my, my uncle was the town foreman and I'd ride with him in the trucks in the snow. And I always wanted to maybe be a dump truck driver till later in life. I learned that, it's not really a great career, but um, I want to do something more than that. I right. want to own the trucks. Right, right. So, yeah, I think like helping your children, I think what we're bringing out in this and if the most important point is helping your children have that conversation and loving them through it to help them maybe have somewhat of an idea of, of what would make them happy, not what you and your family 
and anybody else thinks they should do. Right. Ask them and have an actual conversation. Connect with them and spend a couple of years doing that while they're in high school. It's finding their purpose. You know, not necessarily because even at 14, 15, 16, 17, on up to 25, you're not going to know what makes you happy. That's that's 30 30 years old. I didn't know really almost till 30. Right. I did mortgages for the money. And then at 30, I realized I like, wow, this could really give me purpose and be my life calling. You know, it'll open up the door to a lot of other things. Yeah. So that's the way I've always looked at doing mortgages. You know, a lot of people are great mortgage people. They're great loan officers and they, they're monsters that they do a great job in the industry and represent it well. I just, I want to do mortgages and, you know, I want to, I want to be known for more than just doing a darn good loan. Yeah. Cause eventually making all the money in the world gets old. Yeah. It does. You can do it. You can, you know, put your two feet on the floor every morning and just, you know, a lot of people have a talent for that. I unfortunately never have, but I'm working on it. Mm-hmm. And my, it's, it's always keeping your eye on what the next purpose is going to be. What's going to get you out of bed. Mm-hmm. My father-in-law is 80, 80, still goes to work, still owns the company mm-hmm. every day. And he looks like he's 65, you know, my mother-in-law too. She does, she does her garden club. She's got her book club. Wow. Uh, you know, she's active. They both play tennis still actively and they're just amazing people. Now, dare my mother ever listen to this episode. I'm going to contrast it. She's 82 years old. You know, as soon as we grew up and we're kind of on our own and we're self-sustaining, she never had that next purpose. Mm. So her purpose kind of died as we grew up and every day became about going shopping, coming home at four to catch Oprah and then putting dinner on the table. And that was it. Rinse and repeat. Right. And then, you know, now I mean, God bless her. She's last lasted to 82 years old, but you know, she's wheelchair bound, you know, never really uh, kept her body up, that kind of thing. And she's got two brand new friggin' hips. I mean, for crying out loud, I mean, she's better than most of us. But. We were having a discussion today, similar to that, um, in a coaching group, um, with this mortgage industry specific coaching group that we were on a call and, um, somebody was talking about how they just don't understand people that operate without a calendar, you know, an agenda and pretty driven individual, very successful. But somebody else on the call spoke up and they said, yeah, I agree with most of that, except for if they're happy and that's the way they want it to be, then like, so be it. You know, they don't have to produce at a high level, have, you know, crazy calendars, might not care about money, all that. Right. And I thought that was a really, really good point. It was a very valid point. They're happy doing it. Who cares? Absolutely. But now the other side, the gentleman that was leading the call, he came back with a great question and a great point. And he said, I will accept that. And I do accept that for people. But my question is, what percentage of those people do you really, really think are happy, happy, not being where they want to really be in life? And I think it probably 50, 50, maybe, you know, or they just haven't figured out how to define their happiness. Exactly. What that's gives a them good, joy and purpose. That's a really good point. Yeah. Cause that's a big part of it. If you don't even know what, what happy is. Right. And that, and knowing the understanding it's going to change. Cause I knew like getting into being an electrician when I was 19, 20 years old, I knew I could do it. I knew I could hustle. I knew I could, uh, you know, learn the trade and the craft and make a good living. Yeah. But I always felt like, I'm meant to do something else right now. Right. And I, I kind of know what that is. Radio for me was always appealing, but I always knew that if I got into it, it wasn't the highest paying thing. My brother once told me, I said this in another episode, if you get up every day wondering why you have to do what you are about to do again, that's not a good place to be. Oh yeah. It's great. It is really. Boy. And he told me that, you know, cause he was in a, a job. We were both working for my dad. He didn't enjoy it. Uh, and I guess what, that's what he asked himself every day. Why do I have to do this again? Wow. And I was in that place and I'm going, you know, the hell with it or to hell with it. That's the wrong phrasing to hell with it, to hell with it. I'll go into radio. I'm going to try my hand at it. I know it pays little, but I'll figure it out. And I'm glad I did because it, what a skill set. Yeah. And that's now relevant again. Absolutely. You know, um, and I get paid handsomely for it. 
So it's just a matter of, and then, you know, getting out of that, it became old. Like I, I'd kind of gotten it out of my system, you know, after 30, 35, 36 years old, I was doing radio for about 18 years at that point. And, um, it was time to make some big boy money, even though I had a side hustle that could have been really rocking and rolling had I taken it seriously, but I had to learn something. And the car business for me was my college education. Wow. You know? So that's what you did through college. You worked in the car business. Cut, no, the car, I got into the car business when I was 38 years old with a mortgage and three kids and oh. health insurance and the car payment and all the stuff. And not, you know, I was all of a sudden in a meritocracy that, you what know, what a my, shitty industry. <laughs> it can be. Wow. It can be. I couldn't. I, I ended up working for Mercedes and that was actually a fun time. Okay. All yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. I, I would go and work for like a niche or something. Right. You know, just having to sell used cars. Oh my gosh, man. It's, it's a you tough know, life. It's, it is, but I mean, it's nothing, if you get into it and understand it's a lifestyle and you're, you're okay with that and you get in with both feet, because for the, about three months there in the beginning, I had one foot out the door, but as soon as I just committed, it was off to the moon. Mm. And, uh, and as soon as I had a customer tell me, Hey, I always tell this story. Somebody that didn't know me from Adam said, you need to be selling Highline. I said, you mean like Lexus? And B-? he goes, yeah. I said, well, we own dealerships like that within the company I work for because I was working for Honda at the time. He says, you can totally do it. I said, I just don't see myself being cut from that cloth. Mindset, right? Yeah. He says, you can totally do it. I used to sell cars. I, the way you're handling yourself right now, you need to look into this. Okay. And that's what started me on the path to Mercedes. Wow. Yeah. That's a great story. My wife could have told me that. My brother, my father, my kids. Oh, yeah, Dad, you'd be great at it. Okay, whatever. It was a stranger. Yeah. <laughs> I believed him. <laughs> that mindset shift was important, though. It was huge. It's like Ed Milet says, you're one decision away. You made, it, you made one decision just like that. Yep. And I did, I did very well with it. So my first job, I wanted to help my mom when my dad passed. So I went down to the basement. I got three boards, nailed them together, and made a bench. Then I went down to my uncle's general store. I lived in Underhill, Vermont, a mm-hmm. little tiny small town. And I walked down to my uncle's general store, which was only two stores in town. His was one of them. He was the only one with gas pumps. Mm. So I went down there and got a bag of sugar and got a packet of Kool-Aid. Came back, made Kool-Aid, put it out there and took, oh, and, and got a poster board and, you know, put five cents Kool-Aid. Mm-hmm. So when the bikers came up through the mountain, they would stop, you know, get Kool Aid. That first weekend, I think I made like sixty five cents. Yeah, I was like, this, this is for the birds. <laughs> so the next weekend, I did the same thing, sat up and everything, except I didn't put a sign for five cents. I just put a sign that said Kool Aid. And when they came up to get Kool Aid, they would say, you know, guy came up first one. He said, how much is this? And I said, whatever you'd like to give me, sir. Mm-hmm. And he gave me a dollar bill. Nice. I was like, oh. There we go. Had it happened a few times. You didn't do your market research. Then there was another guy showed up. He <laughs> dropped me a five. I think I walked in with 30 or 40 or 50, 60 bucks. I don't remember. It was a lot more yeah. for me at that time. And I went in and I showed my mom. And I was like, by God, like I was onto something. I, I think it was right then in my blood. I was like, I want to be in business somehow. I want to own businesses. My, and, and it's interesting that you say that because my, I grew up in a family, my father owned his own business, but it didn't absorb until, you know, probably out of my twenties, moved to Vegas and I started my side hustle doing voiceover and production. And I had friends and I had the mindset of, well, I need a, you know, regular job, but I had one friend that I was in a band with and the dude just completely wrote his own rule book. You know, it was always, I'm just doing things my way. And it always worked out for him. He always had good money. He was always driving nice cars. He lived like a rock star lifestyle. And he would like, you know, buy these Camaros, park them in his driveway, cover them with a tarp and piece them out. He's like, yeah, buy it for 500 bucks. I'll make six grand on it. I'm going, what? And it's like, that was a mindset that I didn't understand at that point. And man, if I could go back in time and smack myself, Mm -hmm. dude. Well, gentle, understand it. <laughs> look at what the gentleman that lives right down here, and well, his son does. Spring Hill owns Coparts. Yeah, I mean that's a mega billion dollar company. Yeah, you know he's the one that bought Alan Jackson's house. Oh, really? Yep. Yeah, the old white antebellum out there. Okay. Oh, um, on, um, I forgot what the road is. 
And then his son just bought Jason Aldean's old house. Oh, the old house that he had was on... Uh, I can't confirm that, but... There was one in uh, off of Kedron. It was the one with the hunting land and everything. The, the I think one, every single one of his houses probably had yeah, hunting land. Yeah, it was pretty... It was the one... Yeah. It was down here in Thompson Station, I believe, before they moved in their new one. But anyway... So... Yeah. So on your, you have a podcast you just launched, right? I'm trying. Right. I'm trying. The Hope Dealer Podcast. The Hope Dealer Podcast with Nick Cavuto. My how does that, how's that working? It's, it, we're enjoying it. We've had some cool guests on so far. Right. Um, we've had some, uh, some good stories where, like you were educating me on earlier, you know, I'm, I'm learning like what to do and what not to do, what to be prepared for next time. Right. And I can see how just getting the reps in, like just help you understand and so, um, yeah, we're booking up guests. I think we got nine episodes right now. Right. I think we've released four. Are you um, having guests in person? We have them on the Hope Wagon. Yeah, the, the RV. Right? The motor home, the RV. And so uh, our most recent one we just released last week was Jonathan Fields. Nice. He spent five years in federal prison. Told us about the story they had to kiss his kids goodnight the night before they went to bed. Mm. And the next morning, you know, he, he was, wasn't going to see him for five more years. Mm-hmm. It was crazy. Lost his brother when he was like 16 years old, his best friend. Really? Yeah, just mm. narcissistic parents pretty much were not involved in his life. Really sad story, but really cool how he overcame. So that's a good definition of kind of who's on the Hope Dealer podcast. Yeah, and that's a great name for it. And he's um, he has he's really, really built a great business, mm-hmm. great group of people out there. Yeah, he's a good man. Because on, on your uh, Instagram here, it says, world's best lender, my kids said so. That's funny. Hope dealer, money mindset, uh, 1 billion in fundings, 10,000 clients, and stuff never taught to us about money. Yes, sir. That's me. So basically, what is that, that last part? What, how does that break down? What does that mean? Well, it starts with raw basic elements like... Um, I don't believe anybody taught me about a checking account when I was in high school. Really? Or college. Um, you didn't I, have one then? I had one, but school wasn't teaching me about it. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, credit. I don't remember taking a class about credit. I mean, that, I, re- I remember the, talking about a lot of things in economics, but it wasn't about what credit meant, what the three bureaus were, how do I generate a credit score. Right. Um, and then taking it further... You know, if economics was going to be economics, then I would have thought somebody would have taught me about what return on investment means, how I can leverage real estate, you know, how do you make money in real estate? You know, I think if we taught our kids this, we'd probably sell a lot more houses in the United States, which is the house, I think housing's like 32% of the GDP. Right. Housing pushes everything. Well, I, I, we have a lot of young people working here. And they're all really kind of stressing out, well, how am I going to buy my first house? Yeah. You know, a lot of people are worried about it. And I go, why does buy one door? You know, they're actually, I mean, Cardone, I think, just did something on a, a live uh, stream or something like that. He did a whole breakdown, I'm sure, to sell another thing. But you know, that's how he gets people in on how to uh, leverage, you know, putting so much down for a multi-family dwelling. Yeah, that's... You know? uh, Two to four unit. Mm-hmm. So on November 18th, they just passed legislation where you can buy a two to four unit property, mm-hmm. which is 5% down. Right. So you essentially can get a rental property. And if you get the other three units, if they're rented, you can count that as income on the application. Right. So here's a real world situation on where it's applicable. Um, if you have an aging parent and they can have their own place, but maybe they don't have income. Right. Well, get them a tri- get them a triplex or a quadplex. Let them live in one and rent out the other three, and that makes the payment. They essentially will live for free, right? And so it's a good opportunity. Or you there. cash flowing it, absolutely. And yeah. you can do it for kids in college or kids coming out of college too. I just heard about that idea not too long ago. Buying someone just went ahead and my, my daughter's thinking about Western Kentucky as a, an option, and uh, she's going to live on campus for the first year, I think. Yeah. And someone said, well, you know, the second year, if she still wants to go, go buy like, you know, multi-family dwelling. And she lives in, there she goes. There's, there's her on-campus housing. I'm going, it's a great idea. 5% down. <laughs> I know. It's not a bad idea at all. So, I mean, you know? 
not everybody should be a landlord. Right. Not everybody should be buying up a bunch of real estate. But I think a lot of people right now should be educated on the fact of, hey, you could build equity in a property. You get additional tax deduction. It's a leveraged investment, which means it's not like stocks where you have to put $1,000 down for $1,000 in stock. Yeah. I mean, for 5% down, you can get a three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 property. I'm looking at doing it in Clarksville with my mother, buying a four unit, let her live in one, rent the other three out. And now she lives for free. And then she got her other property and we'll turn that into a rental and make money on that. Nice. But we're all going to start working together more cohesively. And that's why I'm really, really super passionate about making sure that if you're in real estate, if you're in mortgage lending, like start talking about the things that'll help people. Yeah. If it means starting a podcast or a radio show or YouTube videos or video email, or just working on your Instagram more, like start sharing the, the, the correct information with people and educating people out there. That's what they need. Not a photo in front of your latest listing. Right. You know, I don't need a perfectly posed kitchen photo, you know, that's staged perfectly. You know, and every single thing on your Instagram looks exactly the same, like with this brand coloring. Yep. I was just talking to somebody about that this morning. I was like, if you go to somebody's page and it looks like they've curated and had a media agency do every post. I, I actually. <laughs> Mine certainly doesn't. I have, right? But yours is real and authentic. <laughs> oh, it's totally real. And it's I went real. away from it and I caught myself, Jim, asking myself, I said, why am, why am, why am I going away from that right now? Right. Like, what marketing brain? Turn it on. And I said, I'm not feeling comfortable engaging with this page because I don't think I'm going to get the, gen the the real authentic version of the person that's running this page. Right. This is how people are using social media to make their decisions every day, whether to buy a home with you, get a mortgage with you, listen to your podcast. It works for all of us. Yeah. If people know you and they feel like they like you and they feel like they can trust you through what you've put on your social, they'll subscribe to everything else that we're doing. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to learn right now. And it's that they'll get that feel. It definitely put off a vibe. Discernment. Discernment. Yeah. That comes through in social media as well. Absolutely. But do you think that we're over, are we getting to the point where we're getting uh, business influencers slash thought leader fatigue? Oh, yes. Definitely. <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, well, it's... <clears throat> People can pr produce, pretty much all can produce a high level video now. Right. They can make it look really, really amazing. Um, they can fake it that like people like it and are following it. Yeah. But what you cannot get past is are you making people really want to listen, really engage, really keep coming back? And that's the content. Yeah. I think the only thing that's going to change is we're, our discernment's just going to get better at picking out real quick. What do I want to look at? And what I, you'd literally probably have like three seconds to make a first impression on people now. Yeah. I mean, I know people that I've stopped unfollowed because I saw one thing in three seconds and now I'll never see their post ever again. Right. But that I, I've actually been guilty of following the people uh, like Andy Elliott. You familiar with him? Uh, I followed that guy for like two <laughs> weeks and then I felt toxic <laughs> and realized that I just don't like him. He's doing uh, something I call the Howard Stern effect, and he does it very well. He knows how to be controversial. Well, and I just and I'm not I'm not saying I'm a yeah. fan or advocating it, but I mean it's like I know exactly what he's doing. Yeah, and there's other people in the space that we we both know that do it well. They take it right up to the line, and yeah. they're they're most they're genuine themselves. It's who the real deal. But Andy just takes it like over the top, and then you start wanting to poke holes in it. Yeah. So it's like he talks about nobody for his company will work there if they don't have a six pack. Right. And it's like, okay, well, God forbid you get hurt one day and you can't work out for six or eight weeks and you don't have, you know, and it's just like things like that. And then I looked him up and I did a lot of research on the dude because I went down a rabbit trail and I was like, you know, well, he sure talks a big game. He must be super successful. Yeah. And he's, I think he's an ex convict car dealer. He was in the car business as like a majority big scheme of his... and rolled over on his buddy. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he covered his own. And that tells you ass. something really big, Jim, about character. Totally. I mean, I've never done any shit like that in my life. So right. not, not saying I'm going to judge someone forever. I would never have anything to do with him. Wouldn't fall. Wouldn't be a part of his mastermind, but you, you'd have to prove to me people like that. That's where my discernment kicks in. And it's actually, uh, I was on Nick Hyder's podcast a couple of months ago Yeah, and that came up because I actually, Nick Heider promoted something that 
he said, and I went in the comments, I said, well, that works great. I basically, to some degree, the effect that if you're looking for transactional salespeople, perfect plan. Awesome. All you're going to do is shoot yourself in the foot and never really build your business because you're going to be in constant recruitment and training mode and just, you know, revolving door. But if you really want to build, you know, there are car dealers here in town that understand the, the value and virtue of creating a, a very healthy, nurturing, empowering culture that allows their people just to do what they do, especially if they're, the talent is good. Right. They develop the talent, right? Much like record companies did with bands back in the 60s and 70s. They didn't boot you after the first album if it didn't do well. They kept you around. Okay, let's work on the second album. Let's invest in the third album. The fourth album, I think we're going to have a hit. You know, that's what they did. It was our artist development. Same thing, talent development. These guys that are in, you know, perfect example, Mercedes-Benz of Music City, MB of MC.com. Check those guys out. They might be clients. They have a cabal of people in there, a cadre of people in there that are talented. They're good at what they do and they're empowered to do what they do. I've experienced that Mercedes yeah. culture over there. Yeah. So I, I, I have a Denali, I had a Denali pickup truck mm -hmm. and I was having some troubles out of it. And I got upset one day and I was driving by Mercedes over in the interstate and they'd only been open for a few months. I was like, I'm going to just go look and dream at the G wagons. Right. So I drove in there and lo and behold, they had a matte green factory one, which mm -hmm. is, you don't see a lot of them. That's the one I had up right. on my dream board. Mm -hmm. I had no intention, Jim, of buying nothing over there. Right. And then Bia Moshin got a hold of me. Yeah, B. She's, she's B. a soldier. Oh, yeah. And she did, she, she didn't have to do technique. She built a relationship. She listened to me. And then she used a few techniques. Yeah. But it was in a way that, like, we built a relationship, and she still follows up. Her follow-up is fantastic. So big fan of it. I ended up buying the G-Wagon. Nice. She did the puppy dog clothes, took me for a ride on the interstate, said, so mm -hmm. go ahead and take it for a drive, have fun with it. Then she did the uh, fear of missing out clothes, or the takeaway clothes. Right. Said somebody else was coming to put a deposit down on it at 530. And um, I was like, well, I don't want to lose it. So, I And I know it. I've actually worked with her, and she's... She's the real deal. She actually told you that. That meant us, that was probably the real yeah, truth. I, I took her for the truth. It was yeah. really super genuine. So, yeah, you're exactly right, man. You know, it just people are going to rotate out. Em, you know, employers are going to have to understand yeah. that employees are assets, and we have to treat them accordingly. And what I've been doing in my business is helping my guys, my loan officers on my team, build a long game. Right. So that's why I went in relational selling. Absolutely. Yeah. I believe in this so much, Jim, that I went and I built out a full studio in my office. Yeah. You walk in, it's a full studio, podcast table, everything. I mean, I spent a lot of money on it because I want them to be able to go in and hit a button, record content, record with a friend, record with an industry partner, and post your content. Right. And coach them through that the way that somebody didn't coach me through it. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, I'm not throwing shade on Nick Hyder or anything. He's a, he's a pal. Of mine. <laughs> but he, um, we kind of got into it, and I understood where he was coming from because in baseball, that was he was basing his um, thoughts on what Andy was doing on what they do in baseball. And I said, well, here's the difference. I said, much like radio, baseball is a passion industry. All right. You did baseball, you played baseball professionally on, you know, double A AA or triple A leagues for very low pay, because they don't pay anything, right? out of passion, all right? And they knew, the people that were in charge knew they could milk you for that passion and keep you around with the threat of being booted. It's almost, I said, the only other industry that they can get away with that kind of tactic is the military, because you can't leave. Yeah. Once you're in, you're in. I said, these guys that are in the car business, that are under threat of being fired all the time, have really low self-esteems, because they don't, they're, they're really in fear for their jobs. They're not realizing that, well, hell, I can just go to another dealership and just keep on working on this. Eventually, I'll find the one, the right one that will actually nurture me and empower me. Yeah. Okay. So all you're left to do with as a business owner or manager is you're in this perpetual training and coaching mode and recruiting mode. And that's expensive, dude. That's yeah. It's really expensive. A boss em employs others. A boss leads by fear. Right. You know, a, a mentor... You know, a mentor operates by abundance. You know, a mentor leads with encouragement. Right. And 
man, I don't mean to be philosophical about this, but this goes back to these little boy childhood issues where another man can't affirm another man and tell him he did a good job at something. Right. Instead, he feels like he has to tell him what he didn't do right. Right. And I did that bullshit. I did it for 20 years and had a man in my life who constantly told me that everything I did needed to be done better. Right. You know, when I took a tool out of his tool shelf and I forgot to put it back in there, he comes over, he's like, hey, you know, did you use this wrench? Yeah, and my hand's on the bench. It gets smacked with the, with the wrench. Probably broke four, five bones in my hand. Wow. Like, this is what ends up turning into leading other people. Yeah. And, and eventually so, you break, you you repeat the cycle until you don't. Absolutely. So, right. You know, people are like, oh, I'm in a dysfunctional workspace. Okay, quit. Yeah. Go get a new job. Like, I hear people not holding people accountable in their workspace, and it's just, it's crazy. I had people work for me. That they worked for one of my competitors here in town and um, said that when they worked for him, he threw stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, one day threw a stapler across the room. I'm like, how could you ever work at a mortgage office where yeah. somebody was throwing weighted objects across the room at you. Yeah. It's insane. Now that's a situation. I actually worked with a guy and I, I, all this stuff happened after I left and I would hear stories from my pals that were at that place uh, where he would do that temper tantrums, throw things. And it's funny. Cause when you actually look at this guy, it's like, you'd laugh <laughs> really dude. Yeah. And I'm going, and what did you do? Well, none of us did anything. It was just so uncomfortable and everything. I'm like, oh my gosh. Jeez. You talk about that situation earlier that whether well, you actually push this guy, that's a situation where you'd be like, dude, throw it at me, please. Right. <laughs> I yeah. dare you. <laughs> you know? Because it's on. Yeah. <laughs> please throw it. Because not only am I going to freaking beat the crap out of you. Oh, you're going to be crapping it for days. And I'm going to I'm going to come back and sue this company and yeah. own this place. <laughs> Yeah, it's I like, think where do you get off? Who, acting like that, you know? I think uh, we all just have to be aware of it. You know, it's people. Don't, you don't need time. You don't have time for gossip. You don't need you know go and slander or be nosy. You need to stick to your business. Is something my mom always taught me. But at the same time, like if it's going to have an impact on me, I want to be aware of it. Yeah. And here's the other thing: like if I have a friend who I know is interacting with that person, and I know something I would want them to tell me. I'm going to be a damn friend and I'm going to tell him, you know, this thing in society, and I'm sorry, I get, get a little frustrated when I start talking about this, but it's right. like, you know, you got a booger on your nose and I your, do? your friend, no, <laughs> but if you did, I would tell you. Right. So this having friends that won't tell you that you got a booger on your nose, like, man, life is too short for that. Yeah. I need people around me that are going to tell me, Hey dude, like I heard the way you said that. And I do think you were kind of in the wrong. Yeah. You know, I love you, but you're, you're wrong. Right. And like, it's, so we've got to start having that around us. I think really to be oh, the, people that are not yes people. Absolutely. That'll be, that'll shoot straight and tell you what you need to hear. At least, yeah. So going know. back to the boss thing, like 50%, there's three sides to every story. Sometimes the boss is like, sometimes they're not the ones that are at fault either. Sometimes the employee just gets upset because they had to hear the truth. Yeah. I found that out with my kids. And there's a way to do it. Yep. You know, and that's that's one of the things that in the car business, because I had been around the block a few times by that time of my life and knew how to kind of deal with people, um, they would try and posture and do that stuff to me. But what they weren't expecting was me to say, you know, I really appreciate you trying to help me out. I know I'm new and working with somebody like me that's new is kind of frustrating. Uh, totally get it. Um, but don't ever talk to me like that again. <laughs> you know, and they, they would just kind of sit back and say, it's not going to work. Works on the 22 year old or the 18 year old, 19 year old, because they're scared crapless. Out of you. <laughs> uh, but I guarantee you that's not a way to, that's not, you're not building a good culture by doing it. Remember when Grant Cardone used to do that show where people like came in for a job interview and he asked them to empty their pockets? Yes. Oh, that would get me so mad. That'd get me Andy Elliott mad. That was him being shocking. Okay, just being outrageous. He knew what he was doing. Yeah, Grant doesn't really strike me. Not anymore. Uh, no, I don't think so. Because he's gotten out of that game. He's no longer. Andy Elliott, I believe, uh, my theory on him is because Cardone got out of the, he's still doing sales training with Cardone U and all that stuff, but he's so involved with real estate now, it's just in the rearview mirror for him. That's his new purpose, oh. right? So I think Andy saw the void left by Cardone and just, just tripled down on that. That makes sense. Yeah. Have you seen, but I also, I don't know. Like 
Okay, let's say that there's you want to come forward and be completely open and honest about your checkered past and make it a part of who you are. That'd be awesome. Yeah. But at the same sense, it's not really a super sexy story. No. You know, oh yeah, I laundered some money and then rolled over on my buddy. Man, I had life hard. It was really, you know who I like is I like people that you're just like, that guy's the real deal. He's not lying. Right. Like, have you watched this guy, Wes Watson? Mm-mm. So he served 10 years in the California state pen. You should look him up. He's really? fantastic. But the only problem with Wes is like every three, four sentences, you know, there's a F, you know, three, four F bombs laced in there. Yep. I mean, he served time in prison. Mm-hmm. And he talks about how his mindset had to be, how he had to create circumstances, you know, and now he's making three, four, five million on a, on a, on a decent month. Yeah. Like he's doing very well for himself. He consults gyms and shows them how to scale better. Oh, nice. And then he's doing it on the internet. What? And then he has students that come in and he, now he's doing masterminds and, but he's scary, but he's the real deal, Jim. When you listen to him speak, you're like, that guy's telling the truth. Yeah. Yep. He's right. Well, the uh, the prison thing has come up a couple of times in this conversation, and I just rewatched this documentary on Netflix. It's called Untold: Truth and Consequences. Oh yeah, I think I've seen that one. Or um, penalties, something like that. It's about uh, the Danbury Trashers. You know Danbury. Oh yeah, the hockey guys. Right. Have you yeah, watched I've, that? Yeah, I finished Netflix shortly after COVID, so I've seen them all. You see <laughs> yeah, the entirety of Netflix. Yeah, we're doing, COVID, after COVID, it, we saw. All Did that. you see that episode, though? Oh, God, it was so good. Those guys were bruisers. They would I just know. beat the crap out of people. I actually worked with a company who did work in that establishment, the AWD. And I knew Jimmy Gallant. I didn't know him, but I mean, I, it's, I saw him, and, you know, I was around him, and he was just an imposing imposing presence that was the for dad, those of right? you who don't he was the dad yeah, yeah. aj's the kid yeah uh, i actually you know speaking of asking i'll get to, uh, well let me finish this story first so uh rumor has it that tony soprano was based on jimmy galanti i can see that yeah i mean you scored and, a goal against his kid you were screwed you were gonna yeah. get the knuckles put to you <laughs> and your dad would too but talk about just, you know, writing your own rules in life, man. You know, having WWE wrestlers that were at his 10th birthday. I like writing my own rules, but when it comes to me questioning whether I'm going to have to serve prison time or not right. or lose my licenses or whatever, like, yeah, I just never messed with that. I went to jail one time when I was in college. Yeah. You know, I was talking to somebody about this um, who went to jail recently and he was like, I never want to do it again. I never, ever want to be there like that. And I was like, man, I know how you feel. Yeah. So we were out in, in Murfreesboro, and there used to be a bar called Stampede, mm-hmm. dance hall and saloon. Well, there would be a fight breakout from time to time, and there was a big brawl. Well, I was just standing over against the wall, minding my own business, really. I might have got mouthy a little bit with the cop or whatever, but I was like, I'm not doing nothing. Next thing you know, I was in handcuffs in a paddy wagon with about 20, 25 other guys. Just lumped you in. Yep, and yeah. took us to Rutherford County out there. And they're closing the door as they're like bringing in the guys. I'm last in line, and they're bringing in my buddies, putting them in. And they get to me, and they're like, close the door. And I'm like, what? And they're like, full, next one. Yeah. I'm like, oh, crap. I go in there, and there was like five or six or seven dudes. I mean, some rough-looking dudes, some dudes that just look messed up. Um, and I'm sitting there and just out of the middle. No, I mean, I'm just looking down at the floor and like, all of a, because I just I was told don't engage, just mind you know, just shut up, and like all of a sudden I, I'm looking down at the floor and I just hear out of nowhere, "What the f are you looking at, Tommy Hilfiger?" Mm-hmm. And I look up because I had a Tommy Hilfiger shirt on. I'm like son of a. And I was like, oh shit! And I locked eyes with this dude, and he looked he looked country crazy, mm-hmm. like he had from the backwoods, like and then he re- <laughs> somewhere you hear banjos when yeah. he spoke. Yeah, he yeah. repeated it, and then I just looked at him and I said, "I ain't looking at nothing, sir." And so then I went over to the window and I tapped on the glass and the guard came over and I was like, you got to get me out of here. Right. And he got me out of there, put me in an individual cell and I never, ever, ever want to go back to jail ever again. Yeah. That's a different mindset for sure. Oh. But speaking of asking, like we were talking about that earlier, asking the question, right? So I reach out to AJ Galanti on Twitter, on uh, Instagram. Really? And uh, he's got us, they just launched a podcast and everything all about talking about hockey and stuff like that. And uh, I said, hey, you know, if you're ever in this area, you got an open invitation to be on my show. And uh, he got back to me. No. You never know. You just never know. 
That's pretty cool. Like I've had every time I see this guy on TV and movies and everything, I feel like he's going to be on my show. That's Dennis Quaid. Mm-hmm. He lives here in town. Does he really? Yeah. He's got a music career and everything he's put wow. out and he's still doing the acting. I'm like, I just feel like I'm going to talk to this guy. He's a super, super talented dude. Very, very talented. Well, I think that you have to put it out there. Totally. And somebody might end up knowing somebody he knows or be a family friend or something. Well, I'm actually going to start saying that at the top of the show all, all the time. Not only are we trying to get 10,000 average downloads, we're trying to get Dennis Quaid on. Yeah. Let's do it. That'd be a great one. Yeah. Yeah, you got to put it out there. And the more you put it out there, the more you say it. You know, I've always told people the same thing about written goals. Yeah. You write down a five-year vision, five-year story, five-year goals. Watch how fast you get them done in two or three years. Yeah. You know? And if, totally. you don't, if you don't put it out there, nobody else is going to be putting it out there. I moved to town with the uh, notion that when we bought our house and built it down here in Spring Hill, I said, I just have a feeling. I said, well, I'm going to have country singers of note in my living room singing. And I told my wife this. She goes, okay. I said, I don't know. I'm just saying, I just think that's going to happen. And at the time, I wasn't doing any video production. None, nothing like that. what I was doing in 08 and 09. Uh, it was 05, and I was still trying to figure out, you know, how to get involved with the radio landscape and everything. That's what brought us here. And I started doing a lot of video professionally on the side, and it became its own thing. Uh, I did it for a few people of note. And then all of a sudden, uh, Tim Rushlow reaches out to me. He was with Little Texas and Rushlow. He was doing a thing with uh, Larry Stewart from Restless Heart and uh, Richie McDonald from uh, Lone, Lone Star. Star. And he was like, we want to hire you. We saw the video you did for Reggie. Okay, cool. Who else? And he told me who else. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I said, where, where do you shoot this stuff? I said, dude, in my front room of my house. Really? Yeah. Can you accommodate the three of us? Dude, I'll make it work. And my wife, I mean, we'll tell you, what a night. You know, they're singing. They brought their instruments and everything. And here he is singing Amazed, one of the biggest hits of the decade. Yep. You know, biggest wedding hits of the decade in our living room. She said they're on her little Blackberry that she had at the time, trying to get grainy video of it. We got it somewhere, the, the raw footage. But what, a, what an experience. That's I, just, I just had a hunch, you know? That's Same thing about Dennis. I would not be a bit surprised if he ends up on the show. That's pretty cool. You know? Did He's you will it, man. No, in what, a way. What, what movies has Dennis been in? The Rookie. Oh, yeah. Great movie. Yeah. He There's also does never look like he ages. No. He was in a, a movie recently. Like he's doing a lot of Christian movies lately, but he did a, we watched a movie with him. He did a cameo in it as himself. And uh, it was kind of racy, which surprised me. But a movie called Strays. Okay. Yeah. Hey, got to try all different things. Yeah. Well, at his age, he doesn't have to try much more. He's pretty much done it all, man. Well, so, how do people find and follow you, my friend, as we wrap up? Well, um, I made all my handles on my social, uh, the Sean Kaplan at the Sean Kaplan. Um, and if you want to subscribe to like my email newsletter, or you want to find my socials, you can always go to www.cap1926.com. What's Cap- the 1926 signify? So cap is Kaplan, but people have always called me that my whole life yeah. from kid till now. People, for some reason, will automatically just feel like saying cap. Yeah. And so in 1926, my family came here from Belarus, Minsk, Russia, before the uh, Holocaust, which is now, um, would be Ukraine now. Yeah, yeah. And they came to Brooklyn, and they didn't speak English. And so the family story is that my grandpa, Isidore, Mm -hmm. walked up, got off the boat with the family, couldn't speak English. So they just gave us the name of the family in front of us, which was Kaplan. So you got to wonder how much that's happened. So it was established in 1926. Yeah. yeah, they said they would just go through and give everybody the same name. They didn't care. Mm. We, we were actually a Plisky. So I'm kind of thankful that we got Kaplan. <laughs> Plisky's a little... Well, you know, you have something in common with Gary V. Yeah, we're both Jewish. He's from Belarus. And Ukrainian. Yeah. Yep, and have similar stories with our parents. It's His something. mom reminds me a lot of my mom. Really? But when you go to New York and you meet a lot of the Jews, even that's how they are. Even the Italians, you realize, oh, all, all, everybody's mom is like my mom. Right. So I just took my daughters up there last weekend. We took took them around, spent three days in the city. For are that. they uh, decorated for Christmas yet up in the city? Uh, they start the tree was up, but they didn't light it. Right. Uh, ice skating was was in, in full effect. We went there and we went to um, Bryant Park. Bryant Park had ice skating up too. So yeah, it was a great time to go. Right now is the best time to go to the city. 
If I were you, I mean, that's a, you want to get Gary V on your show. He'd probably do it virtually, but that's what I, I would use that as a hook. Really? I said, you and I have similar backgrounds. I'm from Belarus. I'm, you know, Jewish descent, and uh, I've done similar things. I'd love to have you on. You know, it might actually penetrate. He might get on his radar. I'm going to do that. Yeah. I'm going to do that. And I'll tweet you him. You never know. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but like you said, you put it out there and then you you, say, you, 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 know, you never know what may happen. Yeah. But the funny thing is, as, as influential as he was to me, I never really pined to have him on my show. Like if it happens by happenstance, cool. But I never feel like it's like, dude, what, else, what, you, what am I going to get out of you that you haven't already said? Right. You know? Right. I mean, we could probably have a great conversation, but who knows? Yeah. Dennis Quaid, on the other hand, I don't know why. Just, I just feel like he's going to be on. So Weird. Would you pick Gary, Gary V or Dennis Quaid? Oh, man. Good question. I'd ha- and because my feeling, I'd have to go with Dennis Quaid. Man. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'll take Gary V. Yeah. So Dennis okay, Quaid. I will take you up on that and I'll put it out there and see what happens. See what I'll, happens. I'll report back to you. And say, you know, my buddy, Jim McCarthy, one of our mutual friends. Told me to do this. And yeah. if he comes on, you say, uh, you know, now you got to do Jim's show when you come to, uh, it's got to be in person though. That's right. <laughs> so uh, um, for Dennis, you just go on, I'm sure Dennis has a LinkedIn account. Oh yeah. And you can see what his second and third degree connections are and just try to work yourself up to networking. I'll ladder. start asking for it and be an I, man. You never know who knows him. <laughs> You just never know. I mean, also, I need to start saying it on this podcast more, like I have been. I'm looking for the real estate agent that helped Dennis Quaid with his house. You could probably search the internet. They probably already posted that. Oh, totally. Even though they probably send an NDA, but you know. Right. So all your information is going to be in the description. If uh, you love what Sean's been saying, find and follow him. He's uh, wonderful to follow, and it's true following because the dude's got a respectable, notable following on Instagram. Uh, 65.5 thousand followers, as well as you know, the engagement to prove it. So you got to appreciate that because he's a real deal. Everything you heard right here is exactly, that's why I think we hit it off. Uh, and we all just kind of, I, th- I think, you know, we finally got the uh, gravitational pull aligned. Yes, we did. And uh, there you go. So of course, uh, go to what's your problem podcast.com to find and follow, share, subscribe, rate, and review all that fun stuff. Still looking for 10,000 average downloads going into 2024. We're just going to put it out there and hammer it. And uh, if you know people that like what we're doing, have them reach out, give us a review, all that fun stuff. And uh, yeah, what's your problem podcast.com. Sean, thanks for coming out here, pal. Thank you for having me. Jay.